ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره اما بعد فاعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا ايها الذين امنوا لا تقولوا راينا وقولوا انظرنا واسمعوا وللكافرين عذاب اليم ما يود الذين كفروا من اهل الكتاب ولا المشركين ان ينزل عليكم من خير من ربكم والله يختص برحمته من يشاء والله ذو الفضل العظيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقه قولي امين يا رب اللهم ارنا الحق حقا وارزقنا اتباعه وارنا الباطل باطلا وارزقنا اجتنابه امين يا رب so uh, i was discussing the issue of anger uh, in the last few weeks and then uh, i started talking about the media ever since the Osama bin Laden uh, picture came out. And uh, so that kind of sidetracked me from the original discussions we were having. However, I want to close the discussion about the media today. And then we will go back to the issue of family life and, uh, and all of those issues that relate to that uh, for the coming sessions. But I did want to finish off uh, some of the major points that I did not mention or did not was not able to emphasize as much as possible as as much as I should have. So we discussed some parts of the Quran last time that had to do with the media and how the Prophet وسلم, was dealing with the media and that uh, specifically is uh, two parts. Number one, there is a punchline. Number two, the Quran makes a comparison. Look at what you did versus what we have done. And the third is a more detailed, you can say, explanation. And uh, looking at the bigger uh, overall experience of something versus the minor. And I want to give you a practical example of that. Uh, when people talk about 9-11, uh, the happening of 9-11. So we can't get focused only on 9-11. You see, the, for example, if I was in front of the media, I would say to the media that we live in a century of violence. We had World War I, we had World War II, we had 40 wars happening at one time, right? We had Hitler who was a Christian, a proclaimed and an adamant Christian, by the way. He belonged to uh, Christian societies and uh, a lot of his thoughts and views came from the Bible. Uh, anyway, so uh, hit, whether it's Hitler or uh, the Oklahoma bombing or whether it's gang violence, we live in an age of violence. Right. And whether Muslims are doing violence in that or whether non-Muslims are doing violence in that, we're against anybody killing innocent people for political gains. So, uh, so of course, we, you will not, this is what, when, we were, when the, uh, the same ayahs are talking about uh, alcohol, it's, ben, it's harm is greater than the benefit. So you never focus into where they want you to focus but you focus out of where they're focusing you to the general picture so that you have a general understanding so um, so that's one important thing and then the other thing that I talked about was the issue of sourcing and by the way about the issue of sourcing that I want to elaborate further on that is that we should have our own Muslim institutions of sourcing why because a journalist he has some source inside some company or inside the government but he can't name the source because he will lo he, that source doesn't want to lose his job or does not want to hurt himself. So there is a third party that has the record of the real name of the real person. And they have given him a fake ID, fake name. And then this institute of sourcing can verify that yes, he is, in, in, he is one of the, we have a file on this person. He is talking to such and such correspondent in such and such journal. We will not release this information, but he is having this conversation. And uh, so this institute becomes the, uh, in Islam it would have to be something like that. Because either your sources are, either there's shahada, somebody is giving a source, or there's shahada ala shahada, which is that somebody else is verifying the source. So like for example in the case of moon sighting, someone sees the moon, is one way of doing it. But the other is, I saw the moon, but you, you talk to me. 
So in the case of sourcing, it would be shahada ala shahada, which is that somebody is verifying that this institute is verifying that yes, we have the real source, and so on and so forth. And in that institute, the Islamic uh, general guidance of two witnesses and all of that is kept within that institute. Okay? So there would have to be in, Islamic, in, in the Islamic civilization, if we have our own Islamic state or Islamic civilization or Islamic society, we would have to have an institute that all the journalists and the media people are able to use as a source of verifying their source. Because if I have a source, then that's just me who has the source inside some company or the government. But there's no person to second it. But then if somebody wants to become a source, whether in a criminal investigation, he's a source against someone, or for a news purpose, he's a source, then there would have to be some sort of institute that verifies that person being a real source. Okay. Um, and, and, and there have been many, issue, many times in, 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 in recent history where people who were claiming to be sources of something uh, their information turned out completely wrong, obviously. Uh, for example, uh, the sources of information, the elite of Iraq that was saying, come here and take over you know, uh, Iraq and we will celebrate America's entrance into Iraq. This is what the elite of Iraq was telling the American officials. And so uh, this type of information uh, can be problematic. So there has to be some middle uh, sourcing agency that then complies with all of these things. And the other thing that I wanted to mention, that ayah that's mentioned in Surah Al-Hujrat, in Ja'akum Fasikum Bi Naba'in Fatabayyanu, if some, some person comes to you with wrong news. Now the word Fasit is mentioned here beforehand, with the, the, because for, for various fiqhi reasons, I'm not, because this ayah applies in the case of Fasit, it doesn't apply in the other areas. So if somebody comes to you, some Fasit comes with you to some news, verify it. Otherwise, you may find yourself uh, regretful for what you would have done. So, over here, uh, the issue is that when it comes to sourcing, our tradition of sourcing is based upon hadith. Meaning we already have a very rich tradition of sourcing information and so on and so forth. And just all the laws... By the way, I want to ask you an interesting question. Because this... Uh, the status of hadith has to be understood within this context. Do you believe in hadith? Tell me. Do you believe in hadith? Yes. Okay. Do you believe in Imam Ibn Bukhari, the book of Bukhari? Do you believe in it? Yes. Okay. You believe in Bukhari? You believe in Bukhari? Yes. You believe in Muslim? Abu Dawud, Tirmizi? But they're not part of our Iman? I didn't study that one once. No. Bukhari, Muslim, Abu Dawud, and the books of Hadith, we trust in them. We what? Trust. We trust them as sources of document. We do not have Iman in them per se. We have Iman in the sayings of the Prophet This is a very important distinction. We don't have, I, I cannot say I have Iman in Sahih Bukhari. Like I can say I have Iman on the book of Allah. You can say that, right? Because you have to believe in the book of Allah. But you can't say, I believe in the book of Allah and I believe in Bukhari equally. You can't say that. Because book of Allah, you have to believe in the book of Allah. Sayyid Bukhari can have, Sayyid Bukhari is a historical document that has used the process of verification for the statements of the Prophet So those stringent criteria that was used for verifying the sayings of the Prophet ﷺ, the same stringent criteria will be used to verify any source, any, any hadith. doesn't have to be from the Prophet. Any hadith meaning any event or any statement. So for example, what are some of the criteria? By the way, this should also be, uh, uh, should take a look at some important issues. Number one, Hadith started, the Hadith connect, collection, the collection of Imam Bukhari, Imam Muslim started when? Because this will tell you how this becomes important in terms of sourcing. When did it start? How many years after the Prophet did Bukhari come into the picture? Huh? 300 years after the Prophet. Sahih Bukhari comes into the, into the picture after how many years after the Prophet? 300 years 
after the Prophet Imam Bukhari comes into the scene. Then one says, then you have to ask the question that you're 300 years away from the Prophet, how can you verify anything? Right? It's a very important question. This we're not going to deal with here, but I just wanted to mention because of the time distance between the Prophet and the source, which is about what? The most stringent sourcing criteria had to be used. And the science of hadith is called tar, uh, jar wa ta'deer. If uh, Brother Khalid here would tell you, jar means injury. And ta'deer. Hadith sciences are looked at from the perspective of their wrong. When you approach any hadith, you approach any hadith, a muhaddis of that time would approach any hadith from the perspective that it is what? Misinformation. And from that bias, it would have to prove itself to be correct. So when any time in Islam, a source comes to you of some news, right, that you have to trust, you always look at it from the perspective of distrust. If it's information, outside information, coming inside, you have to look at any source from the perspective of distrust. And in fact, any person who studied media, this is exactly what they train the media people to do, is to be, be very wary of statistics, of polls, of sources, so on and so forth. We're going to discuss this in a little bit. But, what are the basic things in, for, in terms of... Now, I'm relating the science of hadith, I'm making qiyas. I'm saying this, the issue of sourcing is related to the science of hadith, and what has been done in the science of hadith is a qiyas for how sourcing can be done. So there are like some basic things. For example, the number of sources, right? The number of sources. For example, in the case of hadith, it can be, are the people in Baghdad saying the exact same words that the Prophet said this, 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 as the people in Medina are saying? Oh, okay. So, so pe people in three, four different cities, five different cities are saying the exact same thing that the Prophet said this, this, this. By the way, just so this issue is clear, 300 years after the Prophet wasallam, being away from the Prophet a distance of 300 years is... is and that is a separate lecture, but in very short, I just want to mention, is a, how many links between the Prophet and the source. The average, if you pick up the hadith of Bukhari, the person will say, such and such person said that, such and such person said. Going back to the Prophet is usually how many links? Seven. Seven is the average. Meaning, anyone who had contact with their grandfather in both sides, the person who's speaking, who heard from his grandfather, who heard from his grandfather, which in those days was the norm. In those days was the norm. So what we consider, we consider for them to have access to a hundred years because grandchildren and grandparents were very close. So the, the overlap of about a hundred years or uh, is, is very uh, like hundred, uh, 200 years is very easy for them at that time almost. Going into 150 years, not 200 years. So anyway, so, my grandfather's grandfather, because people, nowadays people don't know what my grandfather has to say. But in those days, people knew exactly what their grandfathers had to say. And the grandfather's grandfather would take them back to the time of the Prophet So this is what I'm trying to say. The average link was seven. So in that sense, it's still not very far from the perspective. In fact, there's a great uh, historian, Muslim historian, his name is Tabaqat uh, ibn Sa'ad. Ibn Sa'ad is his name. He wrote uh, the, uh, the great voluminous books called uh, Tariq ibn Sa'ad, the history of ibn Sa'ad. And why he wrote ibn Sa'ad this, because it was seven generations after the Sahaba. So th this thing, why then? Because it was my grandfather's grandfather. And they knew that that is the breaking point where now it will, you know, the next breaking point would be my grandfather's grandfather, grandfather's. So the two grandfathers, the two grandchild, two grandchild, the grandchild who knows his grandfather, and his grandfather who was the grandchild who knows his grandfather. This was enough to take them back to the time of the Prophet Anyway, why am I saying this? So most of the hadiths, uh, by the way, side point again, Imam Malik's muwatta, which some people consider to be, and to me it's very logical actually, some people consider the Muwatta of Imam Malik to be more authentic than Sahih Bukhari. Because the average link 
between the Prophet and Imam Malik was three people. Three people. Ibn Umar said, it would, the hadith goes like, An Malik, An Nafir, An Ibn Umar, An Rasulullah. So three people. That's 150, because Imam Malik comes into the scene 150 years. You see? 150 years. So 150, 150, 300 years. So the grandfather's a grandfather. But Imam Malik was, you can say his father was a Sahabi. Imam Malik's uh, father was a Sahabi. So, even though he doesn't quote him in his Muatta of Imam Malik, he doesn't quote him. Tabi or Sahabi? He was a Tabi. Right? Yes. No, Imam Malik's father was a Sahabi. He was... Imam Malik was Tabi. Malik was Tabi. Yeah. So anyhow, uh, but in his Muatta, he doesn't quote his father. So the point I'm trying to make is sourcing is very important. Okay? The number of sourcing, the credibility of the sourcing, the past history of the sourcing, meaning some source says this and this is true, and then you come to know it's false, then next time it does, it presents its sourcing, its credibility gets affected. This is, is this a direct source? Meaning, uh, this is also in hadith. Is it, there is one wording where a sahabi says, Samaratu Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa say, I heard the Prophet say this, this. The other is the Prophet said this, this, this. An Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So is this a direct source? Does this person who is the source have knowledge of what he's experiencing before him? Like if somebody says, the building came down like this, does he know about explosives? Does he have knowledge of explosives? Or, he's, he's, or you know, is, he, is he a reliable source? Not from the perspective of credibility, but also from the perspective of having knowledge of that uh, particular event. Then... Uh, is he an indirect source? I was there, but I, I didn't see all of it. My friend saw it in that sense. Uh, how many links between the source and the actual event? Okay. Uh, how many... Uh, um, how much of the event is completely dependent upon the source? Meaning, let's say a building came down. So the building coming down can be verified in itself. But then the source tells you something about the building coming down. But then there's an event that happens inside a room, no one sees it. In that case, you're completely dependent upon the source. The source says, I was inside the room and I saw some ghosts. So there's, there's nothing else. You're completely dependent upon the source to believe that. Okay. Same thing in hadith, for example, someone says the Prophet said this. But it's not somehow connected to Qur'an. It's not somehow connected to any of the major riwayas or of any of the traditions or any of the history of that time. It seems strange and oddly out of place. But you have only that source to trust. So, uh, the third is, does it contradict common sense, common knowledge? Uh, I mean, that's the seventh one actually. The seventh point. So, Sourcing is the most important thing when it comes to news and information in Islam. So, how do we <coughs> understand that in, in today's context? Now, this is what I really, one of the things that I really wanted to talk about. I don't know how much time I have. But the biggest way to tell what the person is writing, whether it is CNN or Fox, to tell how biased they are or not biased they are, the best way to tell a person's intentions, and they, by the way, this is taught in Hadith books too, is to look at the headlines. Is to look at the headlines. About muhaddisin, we say, if you study the Hadith of science, they will teach you the title in Imam, Imam Bukhari gives to a chapter. A title he gives to a chapter is part of his fiqa and part of his aqidah. A title in Muhaddis gives, for example, the Prophet did this. This means the Imam, believe, the Imam Bukhari or Imam Muslim believes in this. It is the name of the chapter. And then, but a hadith itself doesn't tell you what Imam Bukhari agrees with or disagrees with. Because he's just collecting hadith. He may agree with it. He may see it in a different context. He may not agree with it. So there's so many aspects. But when an Imam writes, for example, Imam Bukhari writes a chapter saying, uh, you must obey the Amir. This means, this is not just 
his opinion, this is his, this is his aqidah, this is his fiqh, this is this is understanding of Islam. And then he quotes in, under that the ahadith of the Prophet So in the same way, headlines are like, headlines tell you the intention of the writer. Headlines tell you most what is the real intent of the writer. So the first thing you look at is the headlines. Right? Because his headlines will tell you uh, what he's trying to really say. So when you're looking at different sources of information, then it is very important that you analyze, analyze the first statement. Okay? Then, number two, when you look at a news column, any writing, any column, when you look at a news column, you have to then see where the writer is adding his own biases into that column. For example, using certain adjectives, using certain uh, coined words, like he can say the conservatives, or the Tea Party, or something that identifies his what? Biases. Now the same thing is there in Hadith literature is that, for example, we know, for example, that such and such tribe, right, was harsh with women, for example. We know this Sahabi, he comes from a tribe, before Islam, they were very what? Harsh with women. So if this Sahabi has something to say about women, we know that it's going to be in the light of his past. In the same way, for example, if Aisha radiallahu says something of the house, if Aisha radiallahu anha, she says something of the house, she's inside the house. She's inside the house, is more credible than another Sahabi who is not a female. Right? If female issues, you will take a Sahabiya, her opinion over the, a Sahabi's opinion on female issues. Right? So when it comes to issues like uh, winning the child, and uh, uh, how does the other women, they become mahram for the child because of weaning and so on and so forth, you would look at these statements of Aisha radiallahu anha more than the others. So, so the biases when a the difference between a muhaddis and a faqih, by the way, is the faqih also is aware of the narrator's biases. The the faqih is aware of the biases of the narrator. The muhaddis is only interested in sourcing. The muhaddis is only interested in sourcing. But he's not interested in the... Because the faqih wants to under, have deep understanding. So he will also keep in mind the background of the person who is saying this. So for example, another example, very quick example, is uh, the, uh, all the ahadiths by Hudayfa radiallahu anhu. All the ahadiths by Hudayfa. Hudayfa was the one who knew the secrets of the Prophet sallallahu So when, when Hudayfa is speaking, he will always speak about the times of the end of the hour, about the jal, about the fitnas that will come. Hudayfa will always talk about this, and people will listen very carefully to him about this, because this is his specialty, you can say. So, when you are again, not just in the science of hadith, but when you're looking at any article or any writing, you want to know about the person who's writing it. Number two, you, you can't, you know, this is why some people that are big into reading columns by someone, Usually people like that person when they know something about him. What's his, oh he's on the conservative side. Oh this is Rush Limbaugh or this is Sean Hannity, right? They want to read by somebody that they can identify with at some level, at some ideological level. In the same way with the muhaddis. When a muhaddis says something, it is not just that he's saying the wordings of the Prophet, but it's also his background that is uh, giving credibility to what he is saying or gives you information of why he's saying this. Now. Uh, an example in our, our day and age would be is somebody writing in the, um, in, 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 the in, in the article are they using the words like pro-choice or are they using words like pro-life so on and so forth okay. so <clears throat> how how does journalists how do journalists express their hidden agendas and by the way, uh, before I go there, I want to mention to you something very interesting. There's an ayah in the Qur'an, 
ayah number 104. Yeah, you amanu. Allah says, "Oh, you people who believe, la taqulu ra'ina. Don't say ra'ina. Ra'ina means pay attention to us. Waqulun zunna. But say pay attention to us. Two different words, different words meaning basically the same thing. La taqulu ra'ina waqulun zunna wasmau. And then listen to what's being said. Walil kafirina azabun alim. And for the disbelievers, there's a painful punishment. What is the lesson in this? Now. The word Ya Yuhladina Aman in the Quran comes for about 99 ayahs in Quran, if I remember correctly, 98 or 99. And this is one of them. And it's saying, Ya Yuhladina Amanu, O you people of believe, La taqulu ra'ina. Ra'ina is a word that has double meaning. It has what? Double meaning. Ra'ina, if you know uh, the Prophet said, Kullukum ra'yun. All of you are ra'i, shepherds. So when they would say ra'yuna, ra'yuna, la taqulu ra'ina, ra'ina means pay attention to us, but it also means what? Our shepherd. Right? So it's mocking the Prophet in this case, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Allah is saying, don't use words that have double meaning. But sometimes it could be positive too, as you'll, there are examples of that within the seerah also. But anyway, the point is, when it comes to the others, you should be aware of statements that they make that have Double meanings. And by the way, the politicians are very careful about this because the politicians look at every sentence and they know oh, how the African American community will react to this sentence, how the whites will react to this sentence, how the Muslims will react. So the, every sentence is scaled based upon the reaction by the different minority groups. So they usually say statements that have double meanings. Whenever you're listening to someone or reading someone of that nature, political nature, you don't want to think about only yourself. But you also want to think as, what if I'm that minority female, or what if I'm the black person, or what if I'm such and such, in order to understand the entire uh, perspective of what he's trying to convey. But anyway, the other lesson in this ayah is when Allah says, لا تقولوا رائنا. Don't say رائنا. وقولون زرنا. But say the same synonymous word, unzurna, O Prophet of Allah, please pay attention to what we may have to say. Uh, why? Because when it comes to the media, what's very important is that we never accept or we become highly skeptical of accepting the terminologies that are being used by the media. That is especially propagating things that hurt the Muslims. For example, one example possibly may be using words that naturally divide us. These are the radical Muslims, these are the moderate Muslims, these are the fundamentalist Muslims. These are not terminologies that may be of our benefit. I'm saying that. These are not terminologies that may be of our benefit. Words that become, words that become coin words. Words that become part of the social uh, culture. Uh, you have to always, you can only have a proper dialogue that you want to have with the others if you're only going to, if you're going to, if you use their terminologies, you've already given in, in a sense. You have to use your own terminologies. You have to use your own understanding and you have to bring your own terminologies to the discussion. You have to bring your own terminologies to the discussion, not use their terminologies. And so what is being said here is that some people say to the Prophet, Ra'ina, there's nothing wrong with that. Listen to us. But because it has a double meaning, because it could have a different agenda behind it, because it's not clear, so use a more clear word. Meaning, don't use the terminologies they're using, rather use the terminology that benefits you. So it's not necessary that we use terminologies that are given to us by the media, but it's sometimes it may be very helpful to coin terminologies that are to our benefit. Right, and so, uh, so, so that's uh, that's something, of course, that would only happen a after we've uh, done our homework. Okay. Uh, the other thing, by the way, I'm coming. I, I I I left out a few things. The other way to tell what the bias of the writer is, and I know I'm jumping here at this point, but just stick with me. The other way to know the bias of the writer is to look at the pictures that are in that column. Right? As they're saying, we are not doing war against the Muslims, but in the background, they're showing the planes uh, 
going into the building, it's like it's like you're you're giving a double meaning. Okay, so uh, this is not a war against Islam, but then they show like the picture of Osama bin Laden or something. It's like a double it's like a double meaning, and we live in a world where it's not no longer about words. Pictures are just image is everything now. Image is what replaces words. So also be careful of that. Um, and of course, in any uh, news article, beware of uh, statistics and polls and things of that nature. Now, coming back to really the issue that I wanted to touch upon. <coughs> when you're dealing with the media, it's very important that if you've seen sometimes Muslims, we go in the media and we start saying, oh, no, 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 no. Those are the bad Muslims or those are the... Uh, Muslims that are no good, but I represent, somehow everybody comes on TV and says, I represent true Islam, right? I represent the true Islam, and the others, they're, they're not really representative of mainstream Islam. I'm the representative of true Islam. This type of attitude does nothing but divide us. It does nothing but hurt us. The attitude to, to use on TV is, if you're on TV, we should say, we the Muslims. Whatever your agenda is, whatever your background is, whether you're you feel you're a modern or a secularist Muslim, whatever you feel, you should say we the Muslims because the minute you start disassociating yourself from other Muslims, right? Now you're just a pawn for them. Oh, so the others do this and the others do this and the others do this and you're just saying yes to everything. So you're, you're, you're for example, if they say uh, Muslims uh, such and such, your response should be yes, we Muslims are looking forward to you now represent the whole Muslims. Don't worry about the, the groups, right? And so it's very important that when we're on the media that we have a we Muslim attitude, okay? We Muslims uh, condemn such and such this rather than, oh, well, the, the majority of the Muslims, they're peaceful people and... Uh, but rather you should generalize it into what Islam says which is we Muslims are against this, and Islam says this about this. Did, unless they ask you, for example, if they're asking you about 9-11 and they say, do you, what do you think about 9-11? Well, based upon the information we have received so far, right, which is not verified, we can only say this, based upon the information you've given us. So it's very important to be, uh, and one of the places where you can really find a weak spot is if you, pay a lot of attention to the sourcing. Okay? And always be clear in your discussion what your opinion is of the source. Just like we do with hadith. This very strong hadith, this is sa'i, this is da'if, this is, you know, uh, hadith, so on and so forth. Uh, sometimes, uh, okay. And in fact, we have something in hadith literature, it's called hadith mashur. Hadith mashur is a hadith that's become very popular. But it may not necessarily have the same sourcing credibility, but it just became very popular. For example, the hadith of the Prophet wasallam, that where the Prophet was coming from the battle of Uhud, and he said, we've come from Jihad al asdar to Jihad al akbar we've come from the small battle to the greater battle. When he was coming back, this is, this is a, not a true hadith, this is, a, this is basically a fabricated hadith. In the same way, when the Prophet said, go to China to learn knowledge, even if it, you have to go to China to learn knowledge, this is a fabricated hadith, this, no, there's no source for this. There are many ahadiths like this. And uh, <clears throat> so when we're in the media, we have to have we the Muslim what? Attitude. Okay? We the Muslims believe this. Or we the Muslims will look into this. We the Muslims will investigate the situation. It's too early for us to say. Okay? So it always should be we the Muslims. And if you look, look throughout the whole Quran with all the events that were happening, where sometimes Muslims were on right, most of the time Muslims were on the right, but few times Muslims may not have done such great things. But the Qur'an never allowed Muslims to be divided amongst themselves. But it pointed to the people we call munafiqeen. There are people inside who will try to divide you. Right? And the people who divide the Muslims in that way, then they are headed towards this state of becoming a state of hypocrisy where they're not being honest to their own agendas. The other thing is, now this is very important uh, uh, media point, and that has to do with Sutul Lahab. 
Now, if you ever want to understand Surat Al-Lahab, what does Abu Lahab mean? Fire. So his name was Abu Hikmah, the, man, the father of wisdom. But they also used to call him Abu Lahab because of the way he looked. So when Quran is point, now this is very important, the Quran does this throughout. When you're in the media, don't just say what you're saying, but quote others. And don't just say, oh, the media is against Islam. Don't do that. Point out the people. Robert, people like Robert Spencer, Daniel Pipes, so on and so Point the people out. Who is? It's, it's of no use to make these general statements. You need to point out when you're in front of the media that these particular people, these particular agencies, they have connections with the congressmen and senators and they are uh, giving out a lot of filth and, and poisonous ven venom against Muslims and these people are completely wrong. You have to name the people. How many times does the Quran say, and they say, وَيَقُولُونَ And they say such and such. And the Quran will quote them and then respond to them. It's very important that you quote, because it's that moment you have in your media time is a time to quote that person and discredit what he's said. Instead of trying to prove something, you quote them. It's much more powerful. And this is why when Surah Al-Lahab was revealed. Surah Al-Lahab is, is, is such a good example of a media comeback. Because, you know, the Prophet was on the mountain and he was saying, come accept Islam. And they said, what have you gathered us here for? And he says, may your hands be destroyed. And so all of a sudden, now this is a very critical moment. The Prophet was doing da'wah. And his entire da'wah of going on the mountain, calling everyone there, that whole process was just washed away with one word of Abu Lahab when he said, may your hands be cut, may your hands be destroyed. Just that word and all the tribes start to disperse. They start going back to where they came from. Because here's a person of authority, he's the uncle of the Prophet of all people, and he says, may your hands be destroyed. So the whole effort the Prophet made just came down to nothing. And how does the Qur'an respond? The Qur'an responds to him by name. It's very powerful. And not only by name, but being sarcastic about his name. Oh, he's Abu Lahab, he's the flame of the fire. Because you know why? He'll be in the flame of the fire. Right? That's what basically it's saying. It's, it, it, is a, it, it is literally, it is a very powerful, Tabbat yada Abi Lahab wa tab. May the hands of Abu Lahab be destroyed. Tabbat yada Abi Lahab wa tab. Ma ghnanhu ma lahu wa ma sab. He will not be benefited by his wealth and his whatever he's earned. Ma ghnanhu ma lahu wa ma sab. Sayasla naran. And he will be thrown and burned into the fire. Tha talahab. That will be burnt. That will be, that is given based upon his name. Will be burning like his, uh, will be uh, burning <coughs> like the flame of the fire. Uh, and his wife, who is what? Now notice how Quran is like so literally powerful. What is his wife? And his wife who carries the what? The wood. What do you use wood for? Put up fire. Right? The other, so it's like he's the flame of the fire and she's the wood of the fire. And she's putting wood into the, she's causing him to even go more into the fire. And in her neck there is a necklace, right? And of this rope that uh, you know that she was using for her carrying the wood so it's referring to that and uh, there, there's other allegories here that I can't go into but the point is think of this I just uh, called the entire world to listen to me one person comes disperses them and then you come up with this right it's a strong comeback it's a very powerful comeback I mean this surah has many other allegorical and literary aspects to it but the point here is is that the Qur'an is quoting them and pointing fingers at them. It's no use going to the media and just saying, Islam, the media is against Islam. No, you have to point to the people that are talking against. You have to name uh, that Peter King guy, Peter King, what's his name? You know, people like Peter King or people like Robert Spencer or Daniel Pipes and so many of the others, right? You have to name them. You have to say these people. You have to identify for the people. You have to personalize it. Uh, you have to 
uh, attack them personally on the media. You have to quote them personally on media because that's what makes your credibility stronger because it shows you know what's happening on the ground. It's not just some uh, half-wired feeling that you have. But you can say, if you study the works of Daniel Pipes, you'll find only venom against Islam. So it's very important as the Qur'an quotes the non-Muslims and then responds. In the same way, it's very important to quote Daniel Pipes said this and this. Robert Spencer, who is the owner of, I don't know if you know this, but these there are like five, six people basically in this country. I don't know if you know. There are about five, six people who today in the American media are basically responsible for 90% of the, in, of the stereotyping that's going on against Muslims above what was going on prior to 9-11. About 90% of this is being done by five, six people. Steve Emerson is one of them. Daniel Pipes is one of them. Robert, Emerson, uh, Robert Spencer, who is, uh, in, uh, I don't know how many of you have heard of the website called jihadwatch.com. You've heard of it? Jihadwatch.com. So, you know, in there he has uh, anything and everything. CARE is a terrorist organization. ISNA is a terrorist organization and uh, so on and so forth. And, and these people have really hurt. In fact, I know a Muslim family that uh, somebody in the family uh, had, uh, had uh, you know, top security and had business with uh, different bids with the government. He won them, and uh, when he gave, uh, he gave two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars to care, and then they revoked his uh, his uh, clearance because of what these people are doing. And in fact, uh, they're doing it in a very systematic way. And uh, that's a separate issue. But anyway, so it's very important when you're in the media, you just don't mention your opinion, but have someone to point to, have someone to quote and then respond to that quote as you're responding to the person you're speaking to. Uh, you got to remember it's a war of stories, right? Meaning they, th there's a story that they're trying to portray about Islam. And the story that they're trying to portray about Islam, it's a matter of which story wins. Is it your story that's going to win or is it going to be your? If you don't have a story to give when you're on the media, right? You have to give a story. And if you can't give a story, you're not going to win. If you don't have a story, for Muslims in America, for example, you're not going to win. To win, you have to have a story. See, the story on the other side, for example, is, well, there are a lot of peace-loving Muslims, but there's a good proportion of them that are quite radical. And we don't know, and you know, they, they've been here for so many years, and there are these cells that can just automatically get activated one day, and they, there's this story that they've created, right? That's just implicitly in the minds of the people. If we don't have a story that's equal or better than theirs, then we will lose the media war. We have to create a story. What are the Muslims in America doing? How are they part of the public square? How are they contributing to society? How are they contributing to morality? So on and so forth. Okay. Uh, by the way, there's one point that I wanted to mention which is very important. One of the good things that's happening now, and America has been struggling with this, because for the longest time, and this is, this is, the exam this is a prime example of the post-modern era. <coughs> See, in the modern era, everything was Western. If you wanted news, the way to go get news is go to BBC. If you wanted news, the way to get news is CNN. If you wanted news, you have to go to some Western channel, some Western source. But in the post-modern world, what has happened is a lot of the things that were purely Western have, have now become, uh, you can say the earth has become flat in that sense. Now what is the effect of things like Al Jazeera or Geo News? The effect is that, there are many effects, but the, this is a very big thing, even though it may not directly be helping Islam or it may not even be directly helping Muslims. But it still is a very big thing that we Muslims, or many of the Muslims, can now have a voice in their own countries, whether it's Turkey, whether it's Geo News in Pakistan, or, uh, or the many different sources of news in the Arab world. What happens, uh, even though I heard Al Jazeera now got bought out by Fox News. I don't know if anybody heard that. But, huh? It was a long time ago, right after September 11th. Right, so they did buy them out. So Al Jazeera is no longer a purely, okay. Still, anyhow, I mean, I guess this is their next strategy, is just to uh, um, buy out them. But, but this really gives, and one of the effects of the news media, the new news media, this is the new news media, one of the effects of this is now, you'll see if you're observing properly, and I don't know how many people have observed this, but both 
the secularist viewpoints and the religious viewpoints when it comes to political issues are uniting. Meaning, if you ask a secular journalist in Pakistan or in the Arab world about an opinion about some steps that the United States foreign policy has taken, if you ask a religious person or you ask a relatively secular person, you will get just about the same response. This is very, very important because this shows that now there is, this shows that what the Muslims are observing whether they are religious or not religious, their viewpoint of, of what they're observing is common. And this is going to, over time, build a very strong consensus. Because it's basically both, you could say right and left, are being brought together on this issue. Okay, the other thing I talked about last time, uh, but I want to uh, talk about it in, in a different perspective. Five minutes? Okay. Um, Okay, two, two, three, three, two, three things, yeah. So three things in five minutes. Number one is the most important thing about media is that it's not just the person who's on TV. There has to be something we call singularity of thought. Singularity of thought is, uh, one of the sociologists came up with this term, but it means that we're all on the same page. The, think of Nation of Islam. You ever heard of the group called Nation of Islam? If you ask any person in Nation of Islam about a question, everyone will give you the same, same response. It is very important, and what the Qur'an allowed in the time of the Prophet is, because the Qur'an was quoting them, they say this, and then they had the response. So when the Qur'an was there, Qur'an was able to quote them and give the response. And so what happened as a result of that, everyone was on the same page. Right? Everyone, why? For example, uh, very quickly, why when uh, Jafar uh, bin Abi Talib, when he was in Ethiopia, he read that portion of Surah Al-Maryam? Right? Because, part of it is because it has that, they ask you concerning this. Right? They ask you concerning this. Say to them this. Right? And so, the Quran is having a dialogue with all these different groups. The Quran is dialoguing with Christians, with Jews, with pagans, with atheists, all these different groups. And the Quran is responding. And so the Quran became a source of where they understood how to respond. So even when it's saying something as simple as, Qul huwa Allahu ahad, in the context it's understood who is asking. Right? The Quraysh is asking, the pagans are asking, say, no, 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 there's not many gods, there's one God. So the context was understood. And so, in that sense, it is very important that Muslim children in, in our Sunday schools, in our universities, in our schools, because of us being a minority and because of us being Muslims, it is very important that every single Muslim goes through a class where he learns to analyze the media. It's very important that Muslim children grow up learning how to analyze the media, and not only learning how to analyze the media, but Muslim children grow up as they get older to, to have these you know, standardized answers for all these questions people have. It doesn't have to be, you don't have to be Ahmadi that to have that, right? It's not about being able to respond to the other. It's about, do we have singularity of thought? Are we together on the same page ourselves? And so it's very important as children grow up, like I would say, from 9, 10, 11, 12, basically the senior years, you have to have one year of teaching children of how to look at sourcing, how to look at media, how to analyze the media, how to, and how to understand how to respond to the media, and, 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 and all the other uh, outlets that can be called media today. So this is uh, also very important that even... Uh, because we live in an age where it's very hard to tell what's true. And this is why, especially because Muslims become the brunt of that, 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 that the in misinformation, the incorrect information. And so Muslims have to learn to accept that there's a lot of misinformation about us. Our children need to learn to accept that. And they need to be given examples of that. And they need to be taught how to dissect it, right? and how to deal with it. Because a lot of children go, go to shock 
when they're confronted with this by their teachers, by their professors, you know, they, they get this overload. They're like, I don't know how to answer. And this sense of helplessness where they don't know how to answer their teacher. Uh, or they feel victimized because it's like somebody's telling you you're bad, basically. I don't know if you saw, what anybody here what happened in Texas, I think, a few days ago, where the professor uh, laughed at a Muslim girl, basically saying, oh, your uncle died, you know, referring to Osama bin Laden. Your uncle died. So, uh, I mean, these, these can be very uh, emotionally terrifying things uh, for the younger kids. So we have to, and parents, actually we should create a parent kit on how parents can teach their children how to teach our Muslim children, teach kit for parents and how they can have conversations with their children on how to deal with the media. And to, to teach them and to make them aware that yes, the media is saying things against Islam and against Muslims, that's not true. And you have to be aware of that. And sometimes they'll ask you questions that you don't know answers to. So how do you deal with this whole information, this situation? This is very important. <laughs>